everyone. Welcome to the Ransomware Defense and Recovery Summit, sponsored by Citrix. Today's event was organized by the hardworking folks at Virtualization and Cloud Review, who have brought together some of the best independent experts on today's topic. Thanks for joining us. I'm John K. Waters, Editor-in-Chief of Application Development Trends, and I'll be your moderator for the first of three information-packed sessions. But before we get underway, I need to go over a few housekeeping details. Each of today's sessions is being recorded for later access. Keep an eye out for an email with a link to that recording. It'll be coming your way within a, the next few days. Each of today's sessions will be followed by a five to 10 minute Q&A. You can type your questions into the Q&A box at any time. Please feel free to add your questions as they occur to you throughout the summit. We'll do our best to get to all of them. Our sponsor, Citrix, has provided some resources that can be found on the right-hand side of your screen. Please take a moment to check those out. And last but not least, at the end of the third session, one lucky attendee will be receiving a Sonos Beam HD sound bar, which must be present to win, so stick with us. And now onto our first session, current ransomware threats and what you may not know. For this session, we've called on Alan Liska, Intelligence Analyst for Recorded Future. Alan has seen firsthand the damage ransomware attacks can cause and how ransomware actors operate and communicate with each other. He has regularly appeared on the PBS NewsHour, CNN, ABC, NBC, and CBS, and virtually all of the leading print publications. He's also the author of The Practice of Network Security, Building an Intelligence-Led Security Program, and Securing NTP, a quick start guide. You're in for a great session. Take it away, Alan. Don, thank you, and thanks everybody for being here today. Um, I appreciate it, and uh, we're going to kind of dive right in. I do, one of the things that I love about these sessions is there's always a lot of good questions, so I do want to leave a good bit of time to ask questions and highly encourage you all to ask any if, you've had, uh, if you have any. Um, so let's start off with 2021 has just been weird. I mean, it's been weird overall, but it's been weird in ransomware. So. We've had some wins and we've had some lose, um, some losses. Uh, NetWalker ransomware got shut down and seems to have permanently stayed shut down. Same thing with the Gregor ransomware. Uh, uh, they got shut down. A GanCrab affiliate, which is a little bit of a callback, got arrested in South Korea. Um, Klopp ransomware had their Teslas and Mercedes hauled off. Side note, that's my favorite part of any one of these ransomware gangs getting busted is getting to see all their fancy cars getting taken off to a uh, to whatever lot is in Moscow or Ukraine or Belarus and uh, sitting there. Um, Feds confiscated $2.3 million in Bitcoin from Darkside. Sadly, it was $4 million when the ransom was paid, but Bitcoin took a bit of a dive between when the ransom was paid and when they, uh, when they were able to recover it back. Um, Avedon, Darkside, uh, and uh, Revil, um, three of the bigger ransomware groups, decided to retire, um, even if it was only a temporary retirement for some of them. But we've also had some big losses or big bad guy wins, if you will. Um, the Colonial Pipeline attack was really bad, followed right up by JBS, followed right by right up by Kaseya, bam, 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 one right after the other, really big, impactful ransomware attacks. We know that 40 million, which to our knowledge is the largest ransom ever paid uh, in a ransomware attack, was paid by the CNA Insurance Company. Um, also, unfortunately, despite all the help from the FBI, both Colonial Pipeline and JBS paid ransom. We know that parts of Dark Side, uh, parts of the Dark Side team, although most likely Dark, the the, the leader of the Dark Side team is back as dark matter ransomware and they've already started launching attacks and unfortunately even with all of the the news and the takedowns ransomware attacks are definitely still on the rise in 2021 we're basically playing whack-a-mole every time we shut one group down another one pops up so that's a lot um we also have to deal with the fact that um Ransomware actors have true zero days now. Um, so what we know is that Reeble used a zero day, or one of Reeble's affiliates, to be more precise, used a zero day 
vulner, uh, uh, exploit to go after customers of Kaseya, so the MSPs that use the Kaseya tool to manage their clients, um, and then use the access they got to deploy ransomware on thousands of Kaseya's customers' customers. Um, so Kaseya themselves weren't infiltrated in the attack as far as we know. It was simply to, uh, the, the Rebo ransomware group bought a vulnerability from somebody that had, been, that had not been disclosed, that had, may not have even been discovered. Uh, apparently, I could say I was working on fixing a similar vulnerability, but, but according to the team at Huntress Labs, uh, the one that was used by the Rebo affiliate was actually a little bit different. This is really big. We've known in the past that ransomware actors have used known exploit or exploits for known vulnerabilities to gain access. This is really the first time we've seen them use a true zero day. Um, and the problem is that ransomware actors have a lot of money. Some of them are better funded than some nation state groups are, which means that they are in the market for more zero days like this and we may see more of those attacks, as scary as that seems. And as scary as that is, it's still uncommon. Um, uh, you know, and so, like, that's going to get the headline. That's going to get the news that, oh, my God, ransomware actors have zero days. But we're still looking at three basic ways that ransomware actors gain initial access into an organization, either through phishing, or credential reuse and credential stuffing attacks, especially with remote desktop protocol, and exploitation. And we'll talk about all of these a, a little bit and, and how they're doing and what they're doing with it. <clears throat> so as a defender, what you want to do is focusing, focus on preventing intrusions from these attack vectors. That will go a long way toward preventing ransomware. No, it's not going to prevent, it, it's not necessarily going to prevent a ransomware attack if they get their hands on a zero day. Unfortunately, there's not a lot that can prevent that. Um, but most ransomware actors don't have it, and so you want to concentrate on the things that you can stop. So if you look at ransomware attacks by, um, by exploitation vector in 2021, we still see most attacks are either through uh, remote desktop protocol or through phishing. By some estimates, uh, remote desktop protocol attacks have actually overtaken phishing in terms of attacks. A lot of that has to do with uh, people are getting better at blocking phishing emails. You know, we, we've had a lot of discussion over time around how you, you know, about training employees for phishing attacks and, and you know, uh, uh, making them alert and making them aware. And that's still really important. But obviously the best thing that you can do when you're talking about a phishing attack is never let it get to employees in the first place. And I think more and more organizations are taking that seriously and they're doing a better job of blocking attacks. So remote desktop protocol is starting to become more popular. It's a little bit easier for the ransomware actors, often because they just buy the access. Um, but then we also see Citrix as being targeted, Pulse Secure VPN, uh, exchange earlier this year. Most of those exchange services, fortunately, have now been patched. Um, we see some. Uh, uh, we see some Sonic Wall. We see some Sophos XG Firewall, some Fortinet. Uh, basically, as we've enabled more and more remote work, we've actually created more targets for ransomware actors to go after, and they are unfortunately obliging by going after those um, by going after those uh, targets. So. While phishing may not be the most common attack vector, it is still very popular. It's very close with remote desktop protocol in terms of common use. So you do need to protect against it. Um, one of the things that's really interesting about phishing campaigns is that most phishing campaigns don't actually involve the exploitation. Human exploitation, yes, but not exploitation of anything which is why they are so effective. Um, so one of the most common ways that we see uh, phishing attacks delivered, and we still see this, especially like with the Conti ransomware group, um, some of their affiliates rely heavily on, um, on, on phishing as a delivery method. 
And what we'll do is uh, send the Microsoft Office document. We've all seen this. You need to pay this invoice. Uh, you have a package that's ready to be delivered, open to get the tracking information, any of those kind of common lures. And they'll put a macro in the document, and the macro will say, you know, hey, um, you know, we'll, we'll execute a PowerShell script or a JavaScript or a VB script Something again that's not a um, that is not a vulnerability or not an exploit, but things that could actually happen on a machine, which is why often that that avoids detection. Um, and so, and, and that will call down the loader, which will reside in memory, and then the loader will examine what's happening on the desktop, um, disable any antivirus or endpoint protection you have bring down the ransomware or bring down whatever other tools the ransomware actor is going to use as they move throughout the network. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, so that's kind of the way it works. Now, what a lot of people have done to avoid that is use GPO, Microsoft's GPO tool, to basically disable macros throughout the organization. There are some parts of your organization that can't live without the macros. Personally, I've never met anybody who uses macros that I like, so it doesn't matter to me. And I get yelled at every time I make that joke. I'm kidding. It's, you know, I'm sure you're perfectly fine if you use macros in your office document. Um, but if you can disable it throughout your organization, that's the best thing to do. And if you can di di disable it programmatically, so not just turn it off in Microsoft Office, but actually use GPO to enforce it, that means that people can't enable that because often people don't know what they're enabling when they enable it. Um, and so that, that is how the attackers get through because they will often have something in their email saying, hey, um, in order to do this, I need to, in order to view this, you need to go to this menu and hit these buttons, blah, 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 and then that will allow you to open it. So they'll actually give instructions to, on how to bypass your security, but if you use GPO, um, then you won't be able to, they won't be able to bypass it and then just put in compensating controls for those employees who can't, uh, who must have macros. Now, the bad guys know that we're getting better at securing Microsoft Office documents, so they're starting to use things like Google Docs and Dropbox links as, uh, as alternatives. So interestingly, what we'll see in Google Docs is um, a, a series of redirects. So you click on the you click on the link, takes you to Google Doc, and then that will redirect you through a dozen or so uh, redirects to the final Google Doc, which then again has that script that you click on, opens, and runs. And the reason they do those redirects is they know that your sandboxes often will uh, check the will check those Google Docs. So. They'll go to the, it'll go to the first link. The sandbox will retrieve that first, make sure that it's clean, go to the second link and make sure it's clean. But eventually the sandbox stops. They only go through so many redirects before they finally let it go through. And so they use that usually a dozen or so uh, redirects in order to bypass anything you may have in your sandbox. And that allows that, um, you know, that allows them to do the, to use the implant. Same thing with um, same thing with uh, uh, Dropbox. They'll, they'll go through multiple redirects before you get to the final folder. Click on that script, and then it runs uh, whatever they need to run. Um, <clears throat> so again, you want to make sure that you're looking at everything. I mean, I've seen some organizations that just straight up block uh, Google Docs. That's not always practical. Um, if you use Google Docs, it's especially not practical. Um, but, uh, but, but, but make sure you're monitoring closely and find out what the limits of whatever sandboxing tool you have is in terms of redirects. Uh, for Dropbox, if you have a lot of employees that are using Dropbox, my recommendation is get a corporate Dropbox because that way you can put it as a private domain. Allow anything in the corporate Dropbox, uh, Dropbox domain to be allowed, but anything outside of that to be blocked, and that will... Um, that will help keep you safe from these kind of uh, uh, more current phishing attacks. Um, so leaving phishing, we'll jump to remote desktop protocol. Remote desktop protocol, again, right now is even more popular than phishing. In fact, 
we have kind of a joke in the security community um, where we've renamed RDP to stand for ransomware deployment protocol um, instead of remote desktop protocol, uh, just because it is so commonly used at this point. Uh, ransomware groups can either ha uh, take advantage of credential reuse or credential stuffing attacks to gain initial access to targets, um, which allows them to basically just walk through the door, uh, through the front door. Um, so when we talk about credential reuse and credential stuffing, the, the sort of the difference between the two attacks are credential reuse is, um, I found your credentials in an underground market and there are literally billions and billions of credentials under there. So it's not hard to find credentials for any organization um, in, in the underground market. In fact, we saw that with Colonial Pipeline. The way that the ransom actors got into Colonial Pipeline was they found the Colonial Pipeline VPN endpoint then they found a username and password for that in an underground form. It was for an employee who had been fired, but they never, um, but they never actually uh, uh, deleted the employee out of the uh, uh, database, at least at the VPN level. And so they were able to just walk right into the network. That is a really common format for these attacks. Then the other way is credential stuffing. Um, with credential stuffing, Basically, the ransomware actors try uh, common username password combinations and just keep going through until they find them. <clears throat> Depending on the settings on your uh, remote desktop protocol, um, they may just be able to try thousands of combinations until they find one that works. Yeah. And they use common account names. There's always an administrator account for the service. There are other common service account names, and they just go through and, and try them until they find a, a matching password. And they can let that run, they can let that run across uh, thousands of remote desktop protocol instances at a time until they get a hit. Um, most of the time though, it's not actually the ransomware after the game's access um, to the remote desktop protocol server or uh, what, however, whatever other login they're using, instead, there's a sort of a cottage industry that sprung up around uh, ransomware, and these are what's called initial access brokers. There are actually multiple cottage industries that, that have sprung up just to um, support uh, 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 ransomware actors, but this one in particular is really big money. Um, so what they do is there are organizations out there that just do this for a living. So there are groups of people that scan the internet looking for systems that they can either exploit or that they can um, uh, gain access to with these credential stuffing or credential reuse attacks. <clears throat> and they, they basically go or, you know, go through and they spend their days, I mean, they don't spend their days, everything's automated, gaining access. Once they've gained access to a system, uh, they figure out you know, what network it is, who it's attached to, um, and then they figure out how to secure that access. So what they want to do is they want to send in a beacon, they may want to move a couple of machines in, but they basically want to maintain access to that network. And once they have maintained access, they turn around and sell that access. <laughs> According to Kila, um, the average uh, cost for gaining access to a network is $5,000. So uh, if I'm a ransomware group, I can buy access for five grand. It saves me a whole bunch of time because you've already scoped out the network. You've made sure the access is good. You've done a lot of the work for me. And with the average ransom, uh, with the average ransom payment in, you know, the average ransom payment in the 200 to 300,000 range right now, um, you know, a $5,000 investment to make two or $300,000 is actually a fairly good deal for the ransomware actors. But it's interestingly, it's also a good deal for the um, for the initial access brokers. So I'm not going to do the math for you, but you know, we estimate, and nobody has an exact number, but we estimate that there were around 65,000 hands-on keyboard uh, ransomware attacks last year, um, and, and that's the kind that we're generally talking about here, not the one and done, but the kind where they move around the network and install the, the ransomware. So even if you take the fact that, you know, one, you know, whatever, uh, one tenth of those or one sixth of those were, um, were by hands on keyboard or excuse me, were gained access through initial access brokers, the number's probably higher 
that's still $50 million spread out across the entire initial access broker uh, uh, community. So, and it's not a huge community. There are definitely more people than there were before, but there are, there are enough of them out there. And, and of course, 5,000 is just the average. Some smaller networks are a couple thousand dollars, but there are some networks that are 20, 30, $50,000. If it's a really big network in particular, um, you know, you'll, you'll get much higher uh, uh, dollar value for that. So, you know, so again, $50 million spread out through the initial access broker community. You see that this is a real and growing, uh, for lack of a better term, a real and growing business. I, I hate, I hate assigning legitimate terms to illegitimate activity, but you know, in, in effect, that's how they see themselves and that's what it is. <clears throat> And then we get to sort of the last um, method of that initial access, which is through uh, straight up exploitation. So with exploitation, um, again, zero days get all the headlines, but most ex exploitation is based on initial access involves exploiting well-known vulnerabilities. So Pulse Secure VPN, Fortinet VPN, Sonic Wall Secure Mobile Access, Citrix, Microsoft Exchange, Sophos XG firewall, et cetera. These are well-known vulnerabilities that just haven't been patched. And those vulnerabilities um, are fairly easy for the ransomware actors to exploit. So what they've done is they've built out a, um, uh, uh, what they've done is they've, they've sort of built out a toolkit where again, they're scanning for all of these vulnerable systems and they automate the process of exploiting gaining access. And once they gain access to those VPNs, they use that access to jump into the network and again, secure and maintain their access. So uh, you know, again, it can be the initial access brokers or the ransomware actors themselves that go after and do this. Um, and this is a, you know, again, this is an ongoing and this is kind of a big problem um, because there is so much out there, there's so much exposed, especially with the last year of everybody working from home, you know. So a lot of times, what we saw in, you know, February and March of last year is companies saying, "Okay, great, what do we have on the shelf? Let's throw that out there, and that's going to be our temporary solution for a few weeks until we can all come back in the office." Well, here it's, you know, more than a year later, and a lot of people still aren't fully back in the office, and those temporary uh, uh, remote work setups have now become permanent but nobody's ever gone back and done a security audit of them. Um, I'm a big fan of when you're talking about a, uh, when you're talking about a security audit, um, uh, speaking of security audits, I'm a big fan of when you are, when, you, when you're looking for vulnerabilities and when you're looking for what's exposed, you really want to do an external scan of your network. We all think we know what we have exposed and what we have out there, and we all think we know um, <clears throat> what is a uh, you, know, you know what what we have patched and what needs to be patched and so on. But so often we don't actually know that there may be a vendor that's set up remote desktop protocol and hasn't let anybody know, um, and it's sitting outside the firewall. There may be other types of VPNs that you're not aware of that provide access. And so it's really important that when you're doing your scans, when you're doing your audits, and you're doing an external scan on your exposed IP addresses, and, and full scan, not just for common ports, but for all the ports, so that you know that there, whether or not there are any vulnerable systems out there that maybe you weren't aware of, and you can try and track down why they're there, who set them up, et cetera. I, I've been in so many incident response uh, uh, engagements where I've been asked, uh, or I've been told, no, you, we, don't, we can't figure out how they got in. Um, we can't find a phishing email or anything like that. And then you come to find out that you know, an engineer that needed to work from home set up a remote desktop protocol server, didn't tell anybody, never patched that system, uh, um, and it uh, got, uh, you know, and, and the ransomware actors were able to gain access um, through that method. And so you really want that external view when you're conducting your scans or um, looking for vulnerabilities, looking for potential weaknesses in your organization. 
I also think one of the challenges that we have right now is we need a new way of thinking about defending against ransomware. So ransomware is kind of a unique challenge. Uh, we wouldn't be having so many webinars and there wouldn't be so many news stories about it and, and everything else if it weren't a unique challenge. In the past, when you had a problem, when, when you had some sort of cyber you know, criminal activity, it was fairly consistent. Like, you know, if I need to protect against NJ rat, I know it does these five things, and then I need to um, <clears throat> I, I need to um, stop those five things or look for those five things, and then I can stop NJ rat. But ransomware is a little bit different because the threat is so diverse. So there are probably right now recorded features tracking about 40 different ransomware groups. But I can't say, hey, how do I stop Conti, for example? Um, uh, uh, you know, Conti right now is one of the biggest ransomware groups. They're conducting the most operations, et cetera. But I can't really say, how do I stop? What do I need to do to stop Conti? Because the way most ransomware works right now is ransomware is what we call ransomware as a service. And that is where they use an affiliate model. Affiliate is their term, not ours. But it works because, you know, you kind of think of it like multi-level marketing for bad guys, right? The way that uh, ransomware as a service works is the bad guy, the, the group behind Conti themselves, build the ransomware, and then they build a portal. And then they recruit affiliates to come in and actually carry out the ransomware attacks. Now, how you carry out the ransomware attack is entirely up to you. You get in, you get your access however you want to do it, and then once you're in, you deploy Conti, um, and then it, the, the ransomware um, node and everything calls back to the portal that Conti set up. It, Conti handles the negotiations. The, the group behind Conti handles the negotiations. They take somewhere between 10 and 20% off the top, and then they give you the rest. Um, so that is, that is the method that most ransomware groups for, uh, 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 use today to gain access, and that's why one of the reasons why it's so um, pervasive is Conti themselves is a relatively small group, 10 to 20, maybe 30 people that are involved in building the portal and handling the, the money laundering and all that other stuff. But they have hundreds of people working for them because of the dozens of affiliates they have working for them, or at least that are deploying uh, uh, Conchi for them. And so what that means is that there are slight, slight differences in every single Conti ransomware attack because different affiliates use different methodologies. Now, there are some commonalities there, um, as we discovered yesterday with the, with the Conti dump. Um, um, but there, there are some commonalities in how they script and everything like that. But that initial access, whether that initial access is through a phishing attack, which some Conti member uh, affiliates use, whether it's through remote desktop protocol, which other Conti affiliates use, whether it's through exploitation of certain uh, uh, technologies, which other Conti affiliates use, that initial access is really, really hard to block because there are so many different methodologies. So I can't say, how do I stop Conti? I really have to say, hey, how do I stop the dozens of Conti affiliates? That really helps broaden the scope of the problem and really helps you understand, oh yeah, this is really, really bad and this is kind of what we, uh, this is kind of what we need to do. Um, but if you move to that mindset, if you move to what are the different Conti affiliates doing, it'll allow you to think of, um, it'll allow you to think the way that they do. So how do you stop them? Again, start with a good phishing prevention program. Training is, is good. But if the malicious never emails never get to employees, stop that in the first. You know, stop them from getting that in the first place, um, and then make sure that you're you're protecting against current phishing threats, not just the threats from six months ago. Really important to keep your employees up to date on that. So yes, the invoice emails, the um, uh, uh, package tracking emails, those are fairly consistent, and those will always be out there. But you have to remember that they're also very invested in what the current news is. So we saw this last year with, with COVID-19, where 
ransomware actors would send out uh, phishing emails purported to be about, you know, COVID cases going up or teams being delivered or, um, or you know, the checks coming out for release. Um, all of these different things, as they were basically happening in real time, they were being used as phishing lures. So it's important to think about that. Right now, there's a whole lot of Olympic steam phishing lures. Um, very easy to get people to uh, take a look at that. Did you see this tumble in the gymnastics? Or, oh, my God, you won't believe what Simone Biles said. You know, these things um, uh, uh, make good uh, make good phishing lures. Um, and, and so, you know, you want to make sure that employees are aware of what the current phishing threat is and what is happening. Um, I love companies like CoFence. They do a really good job of kind of laying that out. Proofpoint's another one that provides really great examples, and, and Area 1 security is another one. Um, you basically want to be aware of what's happening with, the, with those um, because sometimes, no matter how good your security is, the, the phishing, you know, phishing email is still going to get through. Um, again, any system that is externally facing should be prioritized patching for patching and have multi-factor authentication enabled. It's easy for me to sit here as a researcher and say, enable multi-factor authentication. I know, I know managing multi-factor authentication would be a nightmare. I, I'm fully aware, I've done it before, and, and, and I know that. But whatever nightmare or whatever you know difficulties in managing multi-factor authentication, it's still less than paying a $9 million ransom to a, a ransomware attack there. Multi-factor authentication stops so many ransomware attacks, specifically because most of the time they are trying to reuse credentials or they're trying to reuse credential stuffing. If you have multi-factor authentication on any exposed systems, that's going to prevent those attacks. Now, unfortunately, it won't stop it if they figure out how to exploit uh, a vulnerability in, uh, in that. And that's where we get to the next one. You really want to conduct regular external scans of your network to look for exposed systems, especially ones you didn't know about. Um, and then I highly recommend uh, monitoring underground employees for employee credentials being leaked, or excuse me, underground forums for employee credentials uh, being leaked. Um, I, I, have I been pwned offers a great free service, um, uh, and then they, they have tiered services for organizations where you can you know, put your whole domain in and if they catch anything. Um, a lot of threat intelligence companies will also monitor that for you. Um, it's really helpful, but, but again, that's a two-part process. You have to monitor and get the alert when uh, employee credentials have been linked to an underground form, but then you also have to take action. With the current employee, get them to make sure they change all of their passwords and recommend they change their personal passwords as well because they're probably reusing that same password at home and at work. Um, and if it's a non-current employee, make sure they are no longer in any of your systems. So, your IAM process really needs to think about how do you remove them from, from, you know, from that system and how do, you, um, how do you remove them from the system and how do you make sure that they're in any other databases and everything else that you had. Um, the problem with that is that's a lot, right? And I know that's a lot. Um, and, and, you know, each one of these things that I've talked about, oh, we need better phishing protection. We need to enable external scanning. Um, you know, we need an IAM program. We need to monitor for employee credentials. We need to enable multi-factor authentication. That's, that, that's right. That's a six-month to a year project by the time you get budget, by the time you do the implementation, et cetera. And, but, but right now, those attacks are happening right now. So while you are going through your procurement process, while you're deciding which vendor you're going to use and all these other things, that are a normal part of doing business, those ransomware attacks are happening right now using all of those different methods. Um, and, and so it becomes, it, is a, it becomes a real problem where our, our ability in, in a business to move quickly to secure the methods that ransomware actors are using um, is a real problem um, because the ransomware actors don't move as slow as we do. Um, and so that is definitely something that you need to think about as you're kind of uh, moving forward and as you're planning how you're gonna handle security. Um, and then there's one last thing that I wanna leave you with that I think is really interesting. This came from an incident response that I worked on um, a few months back. 
um, uh, without giving too much away, I want you to look at the circled things. And I talked a little bit about this at the beginning, um, but I really want to emphasize this because I was surprised that this wasn't like a, you know, sort of a hair on fire alert. Um, in these scripts that this ransomware actor used, they disable endpoint protection. So they have bad scripts for Sophos, for Trend Micro, and for Windows Defender. There were a few others in there as well, but for screenshot purposes, this, this helps. So again, they're sitting in memory. They've got a memory resident loader, so it's bypassing most of your endpoint detection. And then they're going to pull down and run this script, which is going to turn off your AV, which will allow them to move freely around the network or whatever your endpoint protection is um, to move freely around the network. Well, this generates a log. And I had asked the, 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 the team, I'd asked the security team that I was working with, well, okay, when you got that log, um, what, what did you do? What, what happened? Um, and what they came back with was, oh, well, we just kind of ignored those alerts. Like, you can't do that. Um, you know, and, and like, well, because we get it every time somebody turns off or reboots their computer. Like, but that's a different, uh, you know, being shut down by uh, be, being shut down in the middle of, uh, it, you know, by, by just shutting it off versus shutting it off because the computer's turning down should be two different alerts, and you've got to distinguish between that. Normal activities, normal programs uh, within your, within your, um, you know, within your day-to-day -day operations, shouldn't shut off your antivirus program. So that's one thing. If you have Splunk, if you have QRadar or whatever, really highlight that um, because if you can't stop the external, this is one thing you can do to detect internal activity on the network because ransomware actors often have to disable um, your security services, and that should generate a high-priority alert um, in whatever security tool you're using so that your, your team can go investigate, your help desk team or your security team can go investigate and figure out what it was that caused that. Um, and, and I hope more people will kind of pick up on that and, and, and make that adjustment. Um, so I know we've got about 15 minutes or so left before the next one. I'd love to take any questions anybody has. Again, I really appreciate everybody's time. I hope I haven't bored everybody too much, but um, I'm really excited for oh, this. Oh, God, no. I think you scared the crap out of all of us, but I don't think anybody's been bored. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Uh, let's, we'll get to some of the questions for our attendees. But, but first, before uh, we uh, started today, you, you were talking, you mentioned this breaking news that, the, that the, this Conti uh, ransomware operation um, you, you uh, talked about uh, during your talk about the uh, Conti dump referring to news that, the, that a disgruntled affiliate of the content, uh, ransomware operation, he tried to say, a ransomware as a service outfit has leaked the gang's playbook, including information about one of the ransomware's operators, claiming as the reason that he or she was underpaid. Um, what is this? What the hell? And um, what's the impact, do you, do you think? Well, so it, it, what it is is um, uh, – uh, the um, so again, these are complex business systems, and one of the affiliates, one of the Conti affiliates, got set up because he felt like he wasn't getting paid. He was like, you know, Conti makes millions and millions of dollars, according to the FBI, somewhere around two hundred million dollars over the last couple of years, and I get fifteen hundred dollars a pop. I'm not making enough money, and so he, I guess, went to Conti and asked for more money, and they said no. Um, and so what he did was he released all of the scripts that they use. So a lot of this is a, lo a lot of these ransomware operations are heavily scripted. Um, and so like they literally walk you through step by step what you need to do. Okay, you've landed in the network. First, disable the antivirus. Then you want to download this tool. Then you want to download this tool. Here are the commands you want to run. Here's what you're looking for. You want to look for the Active Directory Controller. If you're going to steal files, you want to look for the finance server. You want to look for any bank statements because um, that helps us determine the size of the ransom and so on. And so this data dump is basically maps out exactly how they conduct their ransomware operations. Now, a lot of us in security have known these things previously. 
um, uh, you know, we, we've kind of known how they work broadly and even a lot of the commands they use. But what this does is it lays it out in very clear, albeit in Russian, um, in, in very clear step-by-step -step instructions so that if you are a defender, if you're trying to protect your network, you know exactly what commands the um, you know exactly what commands the uh, ransomware actor is going to run, and you should be looking for those commands to be run. So whatever your endpoint mm. detection is, whatever your mm. IDS is, however you're looking for these things, look for these commands, block those commands, and you may be able to stop the ransomware attack in progress. Wow. So this guy really stuck it to management. Uh, yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> Basically, that's what he did. <laughs> Okay, um, so let's get to some of the uh, questions. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, um, just want to remind all the attendees that you can type your questions into the Q&A box anytime. Uh, we'll do our best to get to all of them. Um, this, is, uh, this is, I'm sure, a common uh, concern. What do you do if your team is stretched thin? What do you focus on? That's really hard um, because we're all stretched thin, right? Um, for me, what I have been focusing on, is, what, and what I tell people to focus on when they're stretched really thin, is a, sort of a layered approach to security. I mean, we've talked about defense in depth forever, but really, really uh, a, a defender layered approach. So do your best to secure the edge, but don't let the edge. So the nice thing about a modern ransomware attack, if there is anything nice about it, is that it's not a one and done. Um, they need time in the network if they're going to steal files, if they're going to get to your Active Directory controller, if they're going to um, uh, um, if they're going to deploy the ransomware and all that other stuff. It takes sometimes days, sometimes weeks um, to do that. Um, and so there is that time frame in there where if you're carrying out the right hunting missions, you can find them. Right now, I tell everybody, look for examples of Cobalt Strike in your network. Every one of these ransomware actors mm. right now is using Cobalt Strike. Now, that'll change because uh, ransomware tactics change over time. But today and for the next few months at least, if you're looking for Cobalt Strike, that is almost a guarantee. As long as your your team isn't using it for its own red teaming purposes, um, and even then, great, your blue team caught the red team. You did a good job. Um, look for any any examples of Cobalt Strike and uh, investigate and isolate that. The trick is you have to be able to act fast. Okay, let's see here. Let's see if I can get this question put together. It's sort of, all right. Does using remote access apps like AnyDesk or TeamViewer lower the risk of attacks? Hang on. I mean, instead of RDP. You know, it's interesting because the ransomware actors also like to use AnyDesk and TeamViewer. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> it, it can. Um, well, because it's easier, right? It's easier than remote desktop protocol. It's easier than some of the other remote apps. They're nice and easy to use. So they'll set up and they'll run TeamViewer or they'll run um, uh, they'll run AnyDesk as as part of their operation. Um, yes, it can make it easier. Um, just be careful. Know what the difference between your use of uh, uh, of AnyDesk and TeamViewer versus a ransomware actor. So like what time your team normally uses it, what systems they use it for, et cetera. Um, and, and you'll have to kind of know the behavior of your network. Um, but, but yes, it can certainly be uh, easier to, if you use that. Just again, the bad guys will use it as well. Okay. Um, you mentioned all scripts. People have little time to review scripts, uh, need system to review data dashboard. Um, I guess they're looking for recommendation. Um, Some. Right. Yeah. So basically, um, a, a, a bit, right. We what what is going to happen? So this is this is from the the Conky dump um, and, and and the scripts that they use. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. expect you to go through. I don't expect any defender to go through and look at this stuff. What is happening with this information is people like me are going through it, and then we can use that to improve your security product. 
So I know like mm -hmm. Florian Roth is already writing um, Yara rules based on some of the data that's out of here. Um, we'll see more Sigma rules come out and those will be incorporated into the security products that you're using. Yes, no, absolutely. You're already stretched super thin. You don't have the time to review this data and translate it all from Russian into English to understand what's happening. Um, let, let the security experts do that, but that will filter down to make the security products better. And that's, that's kind of what I'm going mm -hmm. for here. Well, sort of continuing on, there, there are several questions here about, in, for example, in your experience as far as endpoint protection, what do you recommend? Would Sentinel-1 uh, be a good option? Um, is there a one-stop shop for small business security as a one-man band? I manage the entire network, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so any tools I can find to make it easier would be great. Um, any opinion on app locker? It's, uh, you know, connect wise and connect wise control. Uh, where are you on recommending solutions? So I, I like to tell people that the best tool for you is the tool that you feel most comfortable with. Uh, I love Sentinel mm -hmm. one. I've done a lot of work with Sentinel one. They have a great team. Um, I also love carbon black. They do great. But no, neither of them are going to do you any good if you don't have the time or the ability to properly configure them. EDRs take some care and feeding to make sure that you're getting everything right for your network. Mm -hmm. So what, what, I, what I tell people is reach out to your security vendors and make sure that you are maximizing the value from your existing security tools. Uh, don't necessarily run out and buy new things. Um, and, and, and I feel like we in the security community have done a disservice to our clients over the last 20 plus years, because that's always our answer to everything is go buy the new thing, right? Um, you know, it started mm -hmm. with firewalls and when firewalls didn't catch everything, go buy an IDS. And when that didn't catch everything, go buy a proxy. And so you wind up with 50 different tools, none of which are talking to each other and they actually make your life more complex. So use, take, the, take advantage of the tools that you're using. I tell people, make your salespeople buy you lunch and um, have them bring a sales engineer along and tell you about the product. Um, now that we can go out again, have them spend an hour telling you about the product and what they can do to stop ransomware and make sure those features are enabled before you spend any more money on security products because you want to get the most value out of your existing tools because you already like using the tools. Now, if you hate them, absolutely. Go get Sentinel-1, go get Carbon Black. There are all kinds of really cool tools out there if you're going to rip and replace. But if you like what you're using, just, just make better use of it. Okay. Um, could periodically changing the login passwords uh, be enough to stop exploitations of RSWs? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's, uh, you definitely could... Um, you definitely should have a periodic password change. I know employees hate that. Um, the problem is there are, you know, we at Recorded Future track password dumps. There are 8 billion passwords um, on, on the Internet. There are more passwords that have been dumped in underground markets than there are people on the, on, on the earth. Um, and, and, wow. and that number is not an exaggeration. That is an actual, the, the actual rough number, it's, like 8.3 billion, that, 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 that's just what we've seen. There are probably more that we don't even see. Um, and so as much as employees hate it, as, as much as it's a pain in the butt, password rotation is really important. But again, multi-factor authentication is certainly um, a, you know, even better. And if you can combine the two, then you're, you're, you're probably golden again, except for exploitation. Um, here's one. What about a managed detection and response approach? MDR? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, um, sure. MDRs are really good um, uh, uh, because oftentimes, and, and we've heard the comment, and we've heard the comment here today, right, that, um, mm -hmm. uh, that, that uh, people are stretched thin. So you, 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 you know, that MDR becomes a force multiplier for you where you have, you know, as presumably a team of experts looking at all these stuff, looking at all these alerts, taking that action for you. Again, really important, make sure you're working closely with them. Um, make sure they have full visibility into your network, um, but also protect yourself because that's what happened with Kaseya, right? Mm -hmm. Is 
the managed service mm-hmm. providers were the ones that were hit, and the fact that they had that sort of mm-hmm. the keys to the kingdom meant that they were able to deploy the ransomware directly to the endpoints. Uh, 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 to the endpoints, so you need to have some sort of compensating control for your for your MDR, and and talk to them about that. Say, hey, what can I do to limit this? For example, one of the things with Kaseya was. Make sure you turn off your antivirus for wherever you're installing our agents. Like, don't do that, ever, ever do that. I mean, I understand why they might want you to. Make your tool work around my antivirus, all right, because, you know, that is a problem. Um, <laughs> so, you, you know, you, you want to make sure that you're, um, you are putting compensated controls in for your MDR, essentially watching the watcher, if you will. Mm-hmm. So just got uh, one just came in regarding password resets. NIST is now uh, recommending against periodic password changes. Uh, they they wonder what you think of that, and uh, and I'm asking, have you heard this? Yeah, so, I, yeah, and I understand NIST thinking. Um, the reason that NIST thinks that is because they live in a fantasy world. Um, no, um, that's mean. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually have a lot of respect for the team at NIST. Um you know, the, the the problem is that too many people take the easy way out with with password changes. You know, where it's you go from what summer 21 to fall 2021 to winter 2021, and then you know spring 2022, et cetera. They they you know do basic simple changes like that that are easily defeatable. I do understand why people don't like password changes. I totally get it. Mm. I still think it's worth it. Um, again, it's even better if you can have multi-factor authentication, but it's hard to get that enabled across entire organizations. And so, um, uh, uh, so until then, the password changing rotation, the password rotation at least helps with that. Mm-hmm. Okay, here's a question that it, now they're not asking for a product recommendation, and they're not asking for you to recommend a specific security vendor. But how do you choose a reputable, trust, a reputable, trustworthy security vendor? How, you know, like like do you have a checklist, you know, to make sure that that this vendor is uh, is one I can trust my whole company to. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, and you often don't know the answer to that. You know, I had a friend, and I know we're almost out of time, so be, be real quick. I had a friend who run a dental office sure. who got hosed in a ransomware attack, and I went in to help him out, and, you know, and, and he's like, I thought my security team was doing a good job. Like, they had remote security. I thought they were doing a good job. They, they completely missed everything. So I kind of had to come up with a set of questions to ask him, um, and, and I think that's what you have to do is you have to think about, that and then have somebody else, you know, kind of like when they say, if you get a quote from a mechanic, have another mechanic uh, get you a second quote to make sure. Um, um, or mm-hmm. if you've got a friend that knows a lot about cars, kind of bring them along. You know, ask one of your security buddies. Most of us will do it for a beer. Um, how, you know, what do you think about these questions? And more importantly, what do you think about the answers? Um, unfortunately, mm-hmm. that is... You know, that's really the best that you can do. At some point, you have to take the vendor's word for it. But, you know, if you ask somebody who knows a little bit about security, they may be able to say, eh, that answer looks a little fudgy. I'd probably ask some clarifying questions or go to the next vendor. Hi, everyone. This is Olivia jumping in. It looks like we lost John there, but we are at the end of our hour anyway. Thank you, Alan. That was a really phenomenal presentation, and we learned so much, almost it's scary how much, <laughs> um, but we just thank you so much for your time. Um, everyone t- stay tuned. We're going to take a really short break, um, grab that cup of coffee and get a cup of tea and, and join us back here for our second session, Best Practices for Security, Defense, and Recovery. Um, and of course, take a moment to review those awesome resources provided by Citrix on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, wonderful. So we'll see you soon. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you to our speakers, my fellow moderators, and, of course, our sponsor, Citrix, for underwriting this summit and allowing us to bring you this great content. I'm David Rammel, editor of Virtualization and Cloud Review, and I'm here to moderate the second session of our Ransomware Defense and Recovery Summit called Best Practices for Security, Defense, and Recovery. 
Our speaker for this session is Dave Kalula, Managing Principal Consultant at Tricon Elite Consulting. Dave is a Microsoft MVP with over 20 years of experience in the IT industry. His background includes data communications networks within multi-server environments, and he has led architecture teams for virtualization, system center exchange, active directory, and internet gateways. Dave, it's great to have you here. Please take it away. Awesome, thank you very much, David, for the kind uh, introduction. And I'd really like to thank John and Alan for that previous session. Oh, that was fantastic. I actually didn't know that there's over 8 billion passwords out there, more passwords than humans on the planet, so that was pretty cool. So this particular session that we're going to be going through here today is one that's really interesting. I've given many talks over the last two to three years on ransomware defense and recovery um, scenarios. And uh, even recently, in the last month of July, I was brought in to help out with an MSP on their Kaseya ransomware um, recovery efforts. So I guess that's where we're going to start off, because that was probably one of the biggest ransomware attacks in modern history that we've seen. Um, I, like I, I heard John mentioning this in his, in his presentation, but when, when, we were, when we were in the fire, I got the phone call, on I think it was Friday, I think it was a Friday, July 2nd. I believe it was coming into a weekend. There was, I remember it was July 2nd. And uh, it's a friend of mine that ran an MSP and you know we were, we were hockey buddies. So I knew him quite well and he's like, listen, we're, we're in bad shape here because you know we've got almost all of our clients impacted. Kaseya was, uh, was our MSP platform tool of choice and we've got Let's say there was 100, 100 customers, 100 got hit all at the same time. And that impacted all of their servers, desktops, everything. And so, of course, I said, you know, I'll, I'll help wherever I can. So put me in touch with one of his customers. And, you know, we started to analyze what was going on. And I thought that this would be a great lead-in for this particular session because as we're going through and discussing you know, what some of the best defense strategies are. I think it's great to talk about an active situation that I was in within the last couple of weeks. So the, the ransomware strain that hit us was, uh, was Rebel ransomware. And, um, and it hit all servers, all Hyper-V hosts, all of our backup targets. Um, it didn't get our offsite backups, but there was a bit of a lag in our offsite backups for this particular customer that I had to come in and help, where the, the closest offsite backup was over four months old, so we didn't, that wasn't really a great option for us. And so we were left in a situation with this particular customer where kind of all options were lost, where we had to take and, and pay. And so you think about this, well, what does the process of, of paying look like? And depending on where you are in the world, um, you may not even be able to pay so, so we were we were dealing with a Canadian organization. We didn't have jurisdictional boundaries that prevented us or precluded us from paying this, you know, threat actor. So, you know, we decided that you know we worked through cyber insurance, and uh, they brokered the transaction, and we did have to end up paying. In case you're in case you're wondering, the going price for Kaseya was fifty five thousand dollars per server, or five million for the organization. For this particular customer because it was almost like throwing spaghetti against the wall and seeing what would stick um the threat actors really didn't have time to, to care about what it was that they were encrypting and we were able to get decryption keys for their their backup target so their backup server and that had a point in time recovery where we had a potential of getting back um, up to 100 percent of our data and uh, this was a this was a good scenario for us because we figured okay well we're talking potentially about a zero data loss here compared to four months if we had to go back to offsite. Now, one of the big things that we ran into was that um, when they set up the backup target, um, they enabled deduplication on this backup target appliance, and the deduplication engine wasn't working properly. And so what ended up happening was the indexes were all kind of out of whack from a dedupe perspective, and the recovery speed went down from uh, a read speed of 200 megabytes a second 
to 900 kilobytes a second, and we had about 10 terabytes to recover. To make a long story short, this made that single restore job, even after running the decryption um, on, the, on the backup files, take over 81 hours for the single primary file server for this organization. It produced approximately 20 days of downtime for the organization. And the biggest tip that I have for you stepping away from this particular um, summit, this ransomware summit, is you must test your restore speeds. Wherever you're parking your data, if you think that that's enough that you're protected, you have to model and mimic these particular scenarios um, because when that disaster hits, you're going to want to know and be able to talk to the executive team and say, we're looking at a five-hour recovery here, uh, big bosses to get your data back, or you're looking at a week, or you're looking at a month. And if you don't know, um, it, it doesn't shed, it doesn't, it, it doesn't look very good on the DR team at that point in time. And the other thing that you want to look at coming out of this particular summit is you want to make sure that you've got backup targets that are immutable um, to ransomware. And so you want to make sure that they're protected from ransomware, and you can do that with either cloud providers or you can do that with on-prem uh, backup targets. So that's kind of where I wanted to lead off. We did get this customer back up and running. It was a lot of downtime. It was very painful. They could have had to go back to four months, and if that four months backup which wouldn't have worked, they're talking end of days. They would have had no data. And so we did recover them. It was 100%. And it was a, a kind of a good learning exercise as we went through this to make sure that you are actively testing where it is that you're putting that particular data. One other housekeeping note before we move on here is there is a Q&A panel as part of this uh, presentation. Um, feel free to ask your questions. We're going to take as many as we can towards the end of the session here. So yeah, this was a scary one. It was all hands on deck for my team for pretty much two to three weeks to try to work with the, with the recovery of this particular organization. And uh, going through the rest of this presentation, I'm going to show you some more tips and tricks to help further prevent um, ransomware. So one of the things that was interesting about the, the Kaseya attack was there was no real notice given to any of these organizations that there was a potential breach coming, which is not all that typical because it was almost like the, the best backdoor or the best skeleton key that was ever invented for infrastructure. Normally, there's traces that a threat actor is inside of your infrastructure. And making sure that you can take and have a good detailed analysis of what's happening in the organization. Maybe you're seeing a bad IP address coming through the firewall. Maybe you're seeing weird logs inside of some of your appliances, maybe on some of your, your network infrastructure. Um, being able to aggregate all of that into a threat hunting engine and uh, a theme solution is really key for, for your organization. You need to be able to aggregate all of this information into one central place so that you can take and do the deep collection investigate what's going on and respond. And then if there is something that's going on inside of the, the infrastructure, have the ability to do adaptive threat hunting with your team to, to try to discover and shut down um, those holes in your infrastructure before they become a big problem. Like I said, the Kaseya situation was a little different because it was a system level agent that had full unfettered access to everything. And so that's not all that typical for what we'll see from a, a traditional ransomware delivery. Typically it's going to be a phishing campaign. The, the threat actors are going to get in through something like that, uh, or they're going to take and they're going to compromise an endpoint. We saw that a lot during COVID-19 with the rush to get everybody out to work from anywhere and unsecured endpoints that were just connected to the network over full-on VPNs, um, and those endpoints would get compromised. That was a potential path in as well. And so having the ability to go through and adaptively analyze that, those logs and that information is really key. Um, I'm a Microsoft um, professional. I work in the Microsoft space every day of my um, IT pro um, life, basically. 
And so, so we really like um, what Azure's got from Microsoft's perspective with Azure Sentinel for um, those capabilities. All right, the next thing is um, my good friend, um, and calling the godfather of group policy, Jeremy Moskowitz, did a fantastic presentation um, that I watched, I think it was about four or five months ago, and it was insider information from a threat actor that took home $4 million from uh, ransomware attacks, and that was the, the kind of the title of, of his session. And if you've ever listened to Jeremy speak, he's just uh, such a charismatic and fantastic presenter. And one of the things that um, the threat actor mentioned inside of the, the interview and the presentation was um, antivirus alone is not enough. Um, antivirus, there's so many ways to evade uh, traditional antivirus that runs on your devices. Uh, you need something stronger. And, and what is stronger? It's called Advanced Persistent Threat Protection, or ATP. In the Microsoft space, uh, it comes as a combination um, through, through their E5 licensing suite, through Defender ATP. Um, I also want to point out that Advanced Threat Protection is also available for the Windows Server lineup as well. We highly, highly recommend it to our, our customers that are out there and you can buy it as a separate SKU. I don't ever like to be quoted on, on pricing and stuff like that, but the price point's not that bad, right? So you can get it for your server landscape as well, and we highly recommend um, that, because if you're just running Defender Antivirus, I kind of equate this to running the home version of Antivirus to the enterprise version of an Antivirus product, and that's what Defender ATP is going to give us from a protection standpoint. So. When we're looking at protecting and preventing um, attacks that are in flight, um, Defender ATP has saved my bacon more than once uh, because we, we put this in with our clients. Um, it's, it's on the desktops, it's on the servers, and we get all of the alerting and reporting um, ahead of time. One particular customer um, that stopped, I think it was somewhere in the neighborhood of six ransomware attacks in a one month period with Defender ATB and those would have gone unnoticed and uh, auto remediation levels were set to full so it actively blocked all of those attacks in flight. This can also be dovetailed in through your um, office subscription as well with Office Advanced Threat Protection, Azure ATP, lines up nicely with Security Center and uh, if, you, if you haven't looked at this yet, you can get yourself a trial with your organization and you can check out a couple of URLs that Microsoft provides. Securitycenter.windows.com is the old URL for Defender ATP. Um, I still like that one better than the new one that they've got, which is security.microsoft.com, which is more of a roll up between all of the products together. And um, I, I highly encourage this because the cost of one ransomware attack versus the additional licensing that you're going to spend um, is definitely well worth it. And if it's not a Microsoft platform product that you're that you're looking at right now, um, look at those other vendors. You know, the, there's great advice in the last session about you know go get some quotes from you know your two or three different mechanics that are going to fix your car. Absolutely, talk to the other vendors that are out there. See what they have to offer. This, this landscape changes so fast. Um, I'm a fan of the Microsoft platform, but that doesn't mean that there's not other great ones that are out there. Okay, the next one is is uh, is, is in the prevention category, and you know how can you know that these holes are plugged? And I think that there was a question in the last session about you know some of the different. Um, organizational standards that are out there like like NIST and things like that. Um, how do we know that we're complying? How do we know that, you know, we're adaptively filling those holes that um, that come on what seem to be a monthly basis? Defender ATP actually includes real-time vulnerability scanning for all of your endpoints and your servers, and it includes all of the applications that are installed on all of those servers inside of those platforms. This is huge for us because you, you don't know what you don't know, right? And so to stay on top of every single exploit that's out, every single CV for every single application is, is almost impossible for an individual to stay up to date on this. 
And traditionally what we would do is we would say, okay, well, let's, let's run vulnerability scanning. We'll purchase some tools and we'll do some vulnerability scanning. And I really hope that you do it uh, more often than just once every six months or once every year because that is definitely not enough. This has to be an adaptive, ongoing piece. Um, what we've done with our organizations when it comes to vulnerability scanning is we actually have teams, uh, members that are assigned roles to have to go through and make sure that, you know, whatever's popping up in that particular month get closed out. And it's actually got a pretty cool tracking system integration with Microsoft Endpoint Manager so that, you know, you can cut tickets inside of there so that the team that's looking after Endpoint Manager, if they had to write custom fixes or things like that to take care of this, um, they're there. And it's not just advice on vulnerability scanning, it's advice on how to fix those holes as well. And so from a security posture perspective, that can really help your organization with kind of ongoing vulnerability scanning. And this should be something that you should add into your team's core responsibilities. And if you're not really not sure where to start from a security perspective, the absolutely worst thing that you can do is go grab uh, an ISO and install a copy of, let's say, for example, Windows 10. Next, 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 finish that install and go live on your network. Um, there are actually no lockdowns in place, really, to speak of inside of that vanilla bill. And so security baselines can really help with this. And uh, one of my favorite sources, there's kind of two places that you can go. Um, there's a Microsoft Security and Compliance Toolkit that you can get that provides some built-in group policy objects that you can take a look at in your organization. Now, did you notice how I said not to implement right away? Because whenever it comes to security baselines, this is a project for your team. You need to test those security settings to make sure that they're not going to break your line of business applications. So don't just go grab a security baseline from your favorite internet vendor of your choice or, or Microsoft, for example, and just go throw it in. It needs to be tested. It needs to be part of a project. Is it a good idea? Yes, it's absolutely a good idea. Um, and one of the other um, vendors that I work a lot with uh, is the Center for Internet Security. They publish guidelines for a lot of different platforms, and it's as simple as just buying a membership. They've actually got a vulnerability scanning tool built in there, and, they, and you can do before and after comparisons. Um, and they also provide um, group policies, sample pre-configured group policies for you, which is kind of nice. And they are also now supporting Microsoft Endpoint Manager. So if you're moving to more of a modern desktop, moving away from group policy from locking down, um, they've got options for both choices inside of there. So vulnerability scanning and security baselining is going to close a lot of, the, a lot of the, the, the easy wins that the threat actors would have, and it's going to help your security posture out um, immensely. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about what happens in the event of uh, an active attack that you're facing. Um, in an active attack, the most important thing to understand is that you have you don't necessarily understand where the attack is coming from. And if it's a triggered attack or somebody has a, uh, a C2 instance where they've, they've got control over a piece of your infrastructure, um, let's say, for example, they've, they've loaded a Cobalt Strike engine inside of there and the tooling is in there so that they can basically remote control and jump around your infrastructure at will, you really don't know where, where that is or where that's located. One of the fastest ways to stop the threat actor from uh, remote access is, A, at least turn off the firewall. So remove remote access because if that doesn't have a touch point to reach back out to the internet to get back to the um, command and control servers, they're not going to be able to continue the, whatever it is that they're doing from a, either recon or delivering payloads or, you know, how far in that they've gotten. The other thing that we always recommend is if you're not sure what's going on and, and you know, you've seen the ransomware attack in flight, shut down as much of the infrastructure as possible because that could be a triggered payload inside of, um, inside of that infrastructure. And if it is a triggered payload that's running in a virtual infrastructure, 
shutting down the virtual machine and preventing it from being encrypted can actually really save you because we can offline edit those VMs. We can mount those virtual hard drives offline without the servers being turned on. So let's say, for example, it was being delivered via, via a scheduled task or something like that that had been delivered and the payload time was 9 p.m. and we, we got in there ahead of it. Well, what's going to happen as soon as you go to reboot that server or turn it on, it's just going to get encrypted. So if we can get access to that data in a non-encrypted format and we can do something with it, sometimes that's a real saving grace for us. So just know that that's potentially an option. I know the business never wants us to go shut stuff down, but like this is this is critical. This is if, if you think that you're in a situation where a live ransomware attack is in flight, I can't tell you how important it is to to act with a sense of urgency around um, going and um, killing as much of the infrastructure as you possibly can, and then we slowly bring it back online. And from a, from a a person that's had to deal with cyber insurance vendors, what they'll do is they'll bring in their um, they'll bring in their, their organizations, their security organizations, and the very first thing that they'll do is every piece of infrastructure that comes online, if you're not already running advanced threat protection, they'll take and start loading up advanced threat protection agents on everything that comes online so that they can try to get some traces and discover where, what, and how this thing is, is operating because the different strains are going to operate in a different way. Okay, so the next thing you're going to do after you turn that off is you're going to make the call. If you have cyber insurance um, right now, and this is actually an interesting one that I want to spend a few minutes on with everyone, because the game has really changed here over the last year when it comes to cyber insurance. Um, your advice that I have for you um, mid-flight in your kind of ransomware journey is you do not want to find out that there's hidden clauses inside of your cyber insurance policy during the attack. What you want to do is you want to have a biannual review of your cyber insurance policy because the policies have changed every year um, over the last three years. And I've, I've had a chance to review several of these policies with um, some of the customers that we've supported. And you need to make sure that you have a clear understanding of what the process looks like in the event of a cyber attack or ransomware attack. Um, for example, what does the process look like? After we make the call, typically there's an email and there's a, there's a phone number that you'll call inside of the policy. And when we make that phone call, what does that look like? What are the next steps? What you have to ask is, what does the timing look like? How long does that third-party organization need access to my infrastructure? How do I get them access to my infrastructure? When will I get access back to my systems? And the reason I say those, those specific questions is the organizations that I dealt with, the outside firms that came in that were trying to do um, root cause analysis and try to figure out exactly where the source of the attack was coming from, it took almost a week of hands-off from our IT team while they were going through and doing their investigation. That's seven days of downtime. That's something that you want to find out ahead of time with that policy because this policy is not just a security blanket that you're going to have that's going to fix all of your problems. The second thing you really have to watch for with your cyber insurance policies is a lot of them have new fine print in them now that your deductible is whatever you're going to pay. And so at that point in time, I asked myself, okay, well, what's really the point? And that's why I bring this up, because I've seen that out in the wild, and that's actually been publicized on um, on Twitter as well. Um, and then the next one is uh, is when, when you take and have to make that payment, if you can make that payment, what does that process look like and how long does it take? The one in July that we did, by the time we decided that we were, had no choice but to pay the $55,000 fee to recover the backup target, we had to um, we had to wait six days before we actually got that key because they were so busy with the, the Kaseya issues and so many people calling in. And that's even if you can make that payment because if there are uh, sanctions that your government puts in place that precludes you from paying a particular country, um, you're not even going to be able to make that payment in the first place. Right? So 
those are some really key ones around your cyber policy. Uh, if, if you're in that space and you're the one that's signing off on that policy and you're listening to this presentation right now, make sure that you do your due diligence around those policies. And the last piece of this is, um, let's walk through a hypothetical scenario here. You've got a million dollars in cyber insurance coverage, and uh, it seems that your organization is going to have to, let's say they even have to pay half of it for whatever the incident is to the threat actors, ransomware, whatever it is. Um, and you decide, okay, yeah, we're going to go ahead and make that payment. You think to yourself, okay, well, as a business owner, my insurance is going to cover this for me. And, and, I, and I want to point this out, it's not like car insurance. If not, you pay your deductible of $1,000 and the insurance company takes care of the rest. No. Every incident that I've seen, the organization has had to front the cash. So I really hope that you have a slush fund kicking around it, uh, half a million dollars to a million dollars to uh, pay because it's a reimbursement model that they have inside of every policy that I've seen. And so um, maybe some of the difference that are out there, but this has been kind of a, an ongoing um, thing and even the last one that I did in July, they had to pay up front and they were going to get reimbursed at a certain point in time from the insurance company. All right, uh, make sure your executives are involved. And the last thing is is uh, send your people home because whenever a ransomware attack hits, and if it's a whole level ransomware attack like an admin level attack like you say, nothing's going to get fixed right away. There is actually no benefit of having people at the office or even and or trying to work. Um, you have to make the call that those team leads. Um, tell people that they're going to be off work for a bit and, and having no the limited access until you can start to bring services back online. Okay, we talked about um, threat protection. So the two that I've seen the insurance companies um, lead with is they'll either lead with Carbon Black or something like Defender ATP. So after that call is made, they'll bring in their um, third-party organization, that's their cyber experts, and they'll come in and they'll start analyzing their infrastructure. And when they analyze your infrastructure, every single thing that they bring online, they will throw an ATP agent on there because that's going to give them tracing to see what's going on. And if there is an active uh, C2 session that's going on, like a, a command and control session, um, they'll be able to trace that. Or they'll be able to isolate those machines because one of the things that uh, advanced threat protection solutions offer is software-based isolation of those machines. So what they can do is if they see that that system on the network is doing bad things, um, they can isolate it from the rest of the network at a software level, not even having to touch the network switches or do port isolation or do anything like that. Um, they can actually do it at the software level so that the only uh, ports and channels that communicate back to that device is the ATP solution itself. So that's one of the big benefits of that. So after... The, the cyber uh, the cyber vendor is going to come in. They're going to start threat hunting. They're going to start checking those logs that ATP is, is uploading, that ATP solution. Um, like I said, if it's a persistent um, C2 that's in there, like COBOL strike, um, it's just waiting to have a re-trigger event or something like that, especially if they've got a min-level access in the primary domain. Um, and so threat hunting is going to allow us to check those logs very quickly. Uh, and from Microsoft's perspective, it's, uh, it's a Cousteau query-based uh, engine, and we can go hunt for events, we can go hunt for files, we can go hunt for triggers. Anything that's uploaded, um, we can take and very quickly gain access to what it is that we need um, inside of the infrastructure. So threat hunting is kind of the next part of that process. The next thing that happens is you're going to go through a discussion because remember at the beginning I said shut everything off and I was probably including all of your backup targets. And so now you're going to go through a process of looking at are backups even viable for you? Is the restore even possible? Were your backup targets encrypted? In the event of uh, one of the ransomware um, calls that I got brought into about 18 months ago, the threat actor gained admin level access um, to the network. And when the threat actor gained admin level access to the, the network, the very first thing that they did is they reconned for backup targets. And, um, and they actually went through and deleted all resident copies of backup data that were available. This particular client had historical copies on NAS devices. Oh man, this threat actor was so nice. They went through and they actually reset those to factory default for us. That was really, I thought that was really a nice touch. And uh, the only thing that they weren't able to touch was an immutable cloud copy that was uh, that was up 
um, that we were able to um, restore from for this particular client. And so we're going to talk about this um, in one of the upcoming slides here, but making sure that your backups are viable is actually um, a quite straightforward process to you. If you're listening to this presentation today and you're the great Windows system man and you listen to all of the advice that we've been giving you over the last 20 years, which was multi-domain active directory, it's such a pain, you need to get to the utopia of a single active directory domain and a single active directory forest. It's so old school to have all of these extra domains to manage. Well, what you have to think about is that if somebody gets admin level access to a single domain, what will happen is, is they potentially have access to all of those backup targets as well, especially if they're Windows-based backup targets. And so if they have access to an admin level breach, now they have everything. So one of the things you want to consider for your backup infrastructure and your core hypervisors is potentially moving those out to uh, a guarded fabric. And by a fabric, it's very simple. Just build a separate Active Directory forest and a separate Active Directory domain. Do not internet connect any of that infrastructure except for patching through like a WSUS infrastructure or whatever you're going to patch it with of limited internet access and uh, highly secured um, different administrative accounts inside of there, different passwords, different credentials, multi-factor authentication. Make sure that those backup targets are safe, okay? Having them in the same domain as all of the production infrastructure that you're protecting is very, very dangerous in today's cybersecurity landscape. More than, more times than I can count I've seen organizations lose all of their backup infrastructure and all their DR infrastructure because it was in one flat, single, easy to use and easy to manage um, domain. And so if that's where you are right now today, you want to highly consider um, some type of a fabric and moving that over. The good news is, is that most of the vendors and even Microsoft, even if you're running Hyper-V clusters, for example, Hyper-V clusters um, support moving to a new forest and, uh, and a new domain. I've done it more than once. I've got blog posts and stuff out on it as well. Okay, so if your backups are not viable and you're in a situation like we were this month, then you have to take and you've got to make a decision whether or not that you're going to pay. Um, I mentioned in that first slide that you want to make sure that you're testing your restore speeds off your backup targets. Um, you want to know how long it's going to take to actually bring that data back and make sure that those backup targets are healthy. I'm going to give you another big piece of advice in this presentation. It's a big note from the field from me. And the big note from the field is uh, DR is just as much production as production. Your backups are just as much production as production. So whatever you're investing in production, you want to consider similar investments from a DR perspective. Because if you're thinking that you're just going to take the oldest hardware that you can scrounge and that's going to become your new backup target, when, the, when you have to lay your cards down on the table and you're in an emergency and you realize that this thing's really not performing and it's going to take 100 times longer for a restore, that's not a place that I ever want to see anyone that's listening to this presentation. Test it and treat it as much as production is production because when you need to restore that, you want to bring it back as quickly and efficiently as possible. Um, we're also talking about the payment negotiation process. We actually had to go through three sets of brokers to, from the time that we wired the money to, uh, to, to acquiring the Bitcoin. And there was like three different sets of lawyers' hands that this went through. And uh, what ends up happening when you have to pay and this negotiation process occurs, you have to have a proof of life file. So you have to grab a file off the server that's encrypted. And, uh, and you send that to the cyber insurance vendors that are negotiating their payments for you. And then what they'll do is when they get the decryption key, they'll test the decryption against that proof of life file before they'll uh, fully execute the, the, the transfer over to the bad guys. And remember, there's no guarantees that any of this works anyway, because um, more often than not, I've seen organizations that have had to pay thinking, oh, well, we'll just run the decryption key and everything will be fine. Well, in the case of Revel, Revel got itself into the windows and the system directories of the, of the servers that we had, and it actually trashed the OS drive of every single thing that it touched. It really didn't care. 
there was actually an XML file that was published with the Kaseya test surrounding some of these pieces, and it was it was pretty crazy. So even if you did uh, have the ability to recover, you were potentially having to rebuild the OS drives along the way as well. Okay, I mentioned the guarded fabric. This right here is probably the single biggest thing that you can do today, is if you're running in a flat domain space right now, considering consider moving out that critical infrastructure, your hypervisors, your backup targets into a different security boundary, into a different security realm. Um, we don't need the same level of domain administrative access inside of there. Um, we want to make sure that we're following principles of zero trust when we're building this out. We want to make sure that we're, we're heavily relying on the security baselines that I had mentioned earlier. And one rule of thumb that I always have now is if you RDP to it, MFA it. You want to take and make sure that you're running multi-factor authentication um, on these pieces. And, you know, uh, trust me, when you have an admin level attack in your primary domain and you have taken the work to set up the guarded fabric and this is, this is now housing all of your hypervisors and all of your backups, it could be as simple as just restoring to bring yourself back. Uh, whereas instead of rebuilding all of that infrastructure and or paying the bad guys. So this has been very successful for us, but it's only as successful as well as you secure it. Don't give everyone inside the infrastructure admin level access to the fabric, only those that absolutely need it. Use just enough administration. Use uh, privilege identity management so that you can take and you can give people access in there, but only for a certain select amount of time. This right here for us is the holy grail. Like if you get access to the fabric, now you've got both environments, you can pretty much do anything. So you want to make sure that you protect that accordingly. Okay, so now let's say that we've gone through that process and we'll take this July scenario that we've gone through. Now it's time to bring critical systems online. Well, when you go through a ransomware attack like this, the the thing you have to look at is which systems need to be brought back online first. And so I always ask the question with the date that it occurs, is that when is the next payroll cycle? Because payroll is something that is very important for every single organization. So I always find that accounting and payroll and ERP systems are one of the first things that we want to bring back online because people want to still be able to be paid. Also consider having a, uh, a uh, if you're using a third party provider, Inside of your process, see if you can have an offline or dark way of continuing to make those payments. Um, because if you had an EFT that you had from last month, maybe you can just replicate the EFT process to your employees from the previous month without having any access to your systems, and that way at least people can still get paid, right? So just consider that from an accounting perspective. You want to have a conversation with your CFO about that because if all those systems go down, what does it mean for people actually getting paid or uh, vendors is a little different because of invoice-based payments and things like that, but at least the employees want to make sure that they're still taken care of. Um, you want to go through a staggered entry um, as we're taking and recovering systems. Not everything is going to be coming back online, yet everything is the most important to every single manager and every single employee that's out there, especially when you've been down for a good period of time. Everybody wants access back right now. So in order to, to curb this and uh, get some shielding to us in the IT department, we need to make sure that the executives have buy-in, we need to have good communication with them, and we need to inform them that, hey, listen, um, HR is not coming back online before the key engineering team is coming back online. The engineering team has deliverables for a key partner or you know customer that's out there, and that needs to be in before the end of the month. And so HR is just gonna have to wait. And so. What we do is we, we typically designate somebody on the IT team to work with the executive sponsors um, to, to deal with that and bridge that. That Typically, that's, that's normally an executive leadership position. You know, a, a C-suite, CTO, CISO, something like that's going to be that bridge for us, or the, a director of IT or a manager is going to be that shield for our resources to make sure that they can still get things done as we're bringing on um, key resources. We're bringing them back online. Now, depending on where you live in the world, um, and if you have had a breach and you have sensitive information in there, there could be a breach notification process that you have to go through. In Canada, it's known as the Privacy Commissioner's Office. And so if we have a breach of internal information for our social insurance numbers, the equivalent of the social security number 
we have to notify the privacy commissioner. Uh, there's also a process of notifying the RCMP, which is equivalent to FBI in the, in the U.S. And there's a breach notification process that has to go on. Depending if you're a publicly traded company or not, you might have to make a public statement regarding the breach, and you might have a certain period of time to comply to that. And um, typically in Europe, GDPR is, is a lot bigger than what it is in, in Canada right now. But you might have some GDPR uh, process that you have to follow as well, as well in regards to breach notification and letting everyone know that there is a potential breach of their private uh, information. Now, protecting against app lockers. So now let's, let's talk a little bit about what we can do from an overall protection of what can happen. A good friend of mine, Sammy Lyhow, and I uh, speak at conferences all over the world. And he is what I'll call one of the kings in the world of app locker. And so um, he, he likes to, to say that with proper app locker policies, you can stop ransomware dead in its tracks. And how is that possible? Well, with app locker policies, what you can do is you can prevent certain executables from ever running inside of your organization. So if there's a particular binary or a hash or something like that that's traced back to an executable, we can choose what's allowed on the network or not allowed on the network. So having a good app locker whitelisting policy is a very good idea for your organization. If you're not investigating this right now, um, how do I equate this? Any employee that has admin level access in your organization can go download executables from the internet and can run them. With AppLocker, first of all, you shouldn't give your users admin level access, follow principles of zero trust, but in the event that they did have the ability to install something in the first place, um, AppLocker can really prevent that and stop it dead in its tracks. The second thing is, is uh, multi-factor authentication. Multi-factor authentication is so important for us because uh, the weak password postures of so many organizations that are out there, uh, MFA can really help us um, with some of these pieces. Talked about advanced threat protection. Um, the principle of zero trust is something that's so important for us, and I'm not going to dive all the way into zero trust in this particular presentation, but I'm just going to let you know um, this quick statement around zero trust. Domain admins only need to log into domain controllers. By default, domain admins can log into everything. They can log into domain controllers, they can log into servers, they can log into desktops as full administrators. They don't need to do that. So what you need to do is create yourself server admins to manage your servers, desktop admins to manage your desktops. Desktop admins can't log into servers, server admins can't log into desktops. Domain admins can only log into domain controllers. And in a nutshell, that's uh, the real concept around the principle of zero trust. That will stop a lot of attacks dead in its tracks. And also, local admin password management solutions like LAPS, like what Microsoft has, are also a very good idea to investigate. And it's not just for desktops. You also have to look at these for servers as well. Okay, let's get to one. Um, cyber team exercises. Got a couple more slides, and then we'll take a few questions here. Um, cyber teaming exercises are now becoming mandatory as part of cyber insurance policies. I've seen this in multiple policies now. They want to see you going through annual security reviews and audits. They want to know if you're going through red teaming and blue teaming exercises. If you're not familiar of what red teaming and blue teaming exercises are. Basically, what you do is you can divide your, your team into, into two parts. You've got a, a red team that's going to be the attacker, and you've got, oh, I spelled that wrong, a red team, that's supposed to be red team. Um, red team and the blue team, and the red team attacks, and the blue team defends, and they'll work together, and the red team can even be an outside organization that's coming in, maybe working through that same organization doing pen testing, and the goal is, is to plug all of those holes as quickly as possible. All right. Now, I had a situation about uh, four months ago where a friend of mine was, uh, was another MSP, actually. And uh, it was really weird. Um, they gave me a phone call, and he's actually a really good friend of mine. And he's like, he's like, Dave, I need you to look at this. This is so weird. It's, it's like the attacker didn't even try to cover their trail. Um, they left all of the sessions open on the domain controller. We can see exactly what they were hunting for. They were hunting for uh, key pass files for, 
for all of your trusted key vaults. They were hunting for, um, they could see what shares they were trying to access, but they didn't encrypt anything. What was going on? And he's like, oh, I know what was going on. They um, uploaded two terabytes of data, and they left all of that stuff there to know, to let us know that they were actually there. And they actually left um, Cobalt Strike instances online um, in the infrastructure so that they could get back in in the event that they didn't pay in them. So step one was, I'm going to do a ransomware with a task with data exfiltration. And at the end of the day, if that data exfiltration, if you've got uh, proprietary information or confidential information, that information is just as valuable to you as if it was ransom. The way less work for them to actually have to go just to exfiltrate that data and get money from you as it is to have to go through and, and trigger a ransomware attack. And so, yeah, they got two terabytes of data. The next day, an email comes in saying, hey, we are Mr. Bad Guy. We have proof of life files. We have two terabytes of your data. And uh, if you don't pay, bad things are going to happen. So in this instance, we were able to shut down the C2 instances. We loaded ATP. We were able to lock it down. And it was deemed that the, that the data that was that was taken um, was was not as critical path. This particular customer decided not to pay. Um, but the risk is always that that data is going to get released out into the wild. So there is such thing as a ransomware attack as well. All right. One more, uh, two more, and then we're going to take some questions here. Um, testing your backups and DR. Um, you do not want to have this as an annual exercise anymore. Uh, remember what I said is that DR and backups are just as much production as production today. Um, you want to make sure that you're at least doing this quarterly. You want to make sure that you're testing not only the ability to back up and restore, you want to test those restore speeds as well. You want to test the time it takes to fail over to DR and whether it's valid and or working. Move those backups into a guarded fabric, as I mentioned earlier. And remember, backups are pointless if they don't work. Why did you spend all that money on backup infrastructure if it's not going to work and if it's not going to do its job? It is an absolutely pointless exercise if you can't recover your files. Okay, so the last thing is uh, post-mortem with the team after the cyber incident has occurred. Uh, you want to make sure that you're investing in cybersecurity um, teams and cybersecurity tools. And so the one thing that I'll let you know here is that if, uh, if you don't think that you're a member of a uh, cybersecurity team, right now if you're an IT pro, you're a cybersecurity pro as well because we all have to do our part in making sure that we protect and we prevent these attacks. Um, cyber tools are way cheaper to purchase up front than having to purchase them post-mortem after you've gone through an attack. Remember, it's not just your, um, just not just the monetary value. It's also the reputation of the organization as well that can be impacted. Don't just rely on your cyber uh, insurance alone, and make sure that you constantly look for updates and training, because staying on top of this is so key for our organization. And with that, I will hand it back over to uh, David. And David, did we have any questions coming in from the audience there? Yes, we do, Dave. But first, thank you for a great presentation. And we have about five minutes to get through these questions. We have a big and lively audience today, so let's get right to it. First question comes from Ryan. You were, when you were talking about, this concerns when you were talking about working with your incident response vendors. And he asked, what questions should we be asking when selecting an incident response vendor for retainer? Oh, it's a fantastic question, Ryan. And so um, the, the big one for me is I would be looking for their, uh, their policy and procedure documentation. And I want to have a clear and delineated understanding of what the process looks like when we are under attack. Um, I'm not so much concerned about the skill sets of their resources and things like that. I kind of want to know the flow of what happened. So when we have to trigger an incident and something happens, what does the next step look like? So those are the most important questions that I would ask. Okay, great. Here's a question from Todd. He submitted it early on when you were talking about how you shut everything down, the servers and everything. Mm -hmm. And Todd asks, wouldn't it be better to disconnect a server from the network versus shutting it down? Great question, Todd, great question. And the reason that I say shut it down 
is I've seen situations where there's triggered timers. Um, the threat actors will actually go through a uh, group policy engine, create scheduled tasks, and those scheduled tasks will deliver a payload. And typically, it'll, it'll happen in a staggered fashion. And so that's why I want to shut them down. So I want to shut them down to make sure that if a triggered payload hasn't been executed yet, it has no chance. If that server is disconnected from the network, yet the group policy object has been rep, um, has been updated to it, that scheduled task exists there now. So there's a potential of even although you're disconnecting, the encryption should still continue. So that's the choice of shutting things down. Okay, great explanation. I was wondering that myself. Here's a question from Edgar. How can you identify if one of your databases have been breached? So the database piece, I would have to I would have to turn that over to the to the DBA team. Um, there are good uh, products that you can probably take and look at that are out there, but that would be a question that would be uh, much better suited for a, a database expert. Um, I'm, I I just don't have the right answer for you on that one. Great question, though, I do. Okay. This comes from Mark. He says, typically ransomware bad actors have been in your environment for several days, weeks, or months. Wouldn't the malware be back up to your backups, whether off-site or not? Yeah, and so, so that, that dormant um, period um, is always something that we are very concerned about. And um, having advanced threat protection is a real key to that. So if you if you don't have advanced threat protection today, typically we can find traces of that with the ATP agents that are loaded, and we can work to remove that. And if there are if there are triggering events like, for example, weird PowerShell execution, um, obfuscation of code is another big one that will that will look for. Um, if those types of events are starting to be triggered on those systems, we'll at least be able to go find them, isolate them, and remediate them. And that's traditionally how we'll deal with that. However, you're absolutely correct where if it is inside of the backups, um, we may have to go back to a period of time before that hits. So ATP agents will, will normally work very well to stop many of those attacks in flight. And that's why the cyber insurance vendors, that's one of the first things that they'll lead with is to, is to put that onto the system to see what's happening so we can isolate and prevent. Um, if they've been in there for a long period of time, um, you know, you're absolutely right. The, the longer you're in there, the more damage you can potentially do. And so taking a good posture where, you know, you're protecting and preventing is, is kind of the best you can do. And I think they say now it's not, it's not if, you're, you've got a breach. It's or, sorry. It's not. Um, if you are going to be breached, it's that you know you have to assume breach now. Okay. It looks like we have time for one more question. And this comes from Ben. He says, "You mentioned training, training, training for small companies that use SOC AAS. I think that's Security Operations Center as a service to help with security." What type of training would you recommend? So I would recommend incident response training for your team, especially if you're outsourcing your security operate operations. Um, think of similar incident response training as to if you had to go through a natural disaster, fire, flood, hurricane, forest fire, something like that. There's incident response plans that can be put in place for your team especially if you're outsourcing that key levels of expertise around recovery, remediation, and some of those pieces as a smaller organization, um, your team still needs to know what to do to work along with them and what those recovery steps look like. So a great incident response plan is something that you can definitely invest some time and money into. Okay, great. It looks like that's all the questions we have time for. So thanks again, Dave, for a great presentation and answering those questions. No problem. Thank you uh, for having me, David, and uh, good luck with the rest of the show.